Good morning and welcome to Thornley Bank Parish Church's Sunday service. Sunday service for the first Sunday in Advent, 29th of November. This morning we're thinking about a sign. We're using Isaiah chapter 7, but we're thinking about a sign, a sign of something greater than ourselves. Isaiah 7 verse 14. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Let's worship Emmanuel. Let's worship God with us. We're not having carols just yet. Next week, we'll start bringing the carols. We're still in November, but we have started Advent. Let's celebrate. Let's sing when the music fades. It's all about you, 
Wonderful song, Matt Redman. Talented man, a very talented man. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, and I'm reading verses 10 to 17. Let's listen to the word of God. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the king, two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time like any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Amen and thanks be to God for his word. Hmm. I wonder what's coming for Ahaz. Before that, let's pray. Let's come to the Lord and let's pray. Lord God, we know how much you love us. You created each one of us out of your amazing love. You walk with us every day on the road of life. You suffer and cry with us as well as laugh with us because you love us. You died on the cross, Lord, because of your love for us. And we dedicate our lives to you and praise your name for the gift of life you gave to us. Well, Lord, so often we, we struggle to understand just how much you love us. Because your love for us is so great, we're unable to measure it. So Lord, although we can't understand how much you love us, remind us how valuable we are to you. Enable us to remember how valuable we are to you and to others and help us to share our suffering with others as we share in their sufferings. Empower us to take some of the suffering of others upon us when necessary. Help us to remember how valuable others are to you and to us, even in their suffering. May we be worthy witnesses of your compassion. Lord, we are one in communion with you and with our brothers and sisters. We are one in suffering and in joy. We are one in your love. And this prayer we offer in the name of Jesus Christ who loved us so much. He gave his life for us. So we make this prayer in the name of the one who died that we may, be, may have forgiveness. And we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we discover what, what was bothering Ahaz and why he wouldn't ask God for a sign, let's worship again. Let's sing Show Your Power. Show Your Power, a Kevin Prosh song. Yeah. 
That's not a prayer, I don't know what is. This is the, the first Sunday of Advent, although I'm sure this year many may have missed that. Many people are looking for a for a sign of hope, aren't we? We're looking to for a sign that's going to say everything's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. We're going to come out of this different. We may come out of this mourning a loved one. We may come out, come out of this with a sense of vulnerability because humankind has been made vulnerable by COVID-19. We may come out of it thankful that we've survived. We may even come out saying, where was God? I get it. I get that one. Christmas won't be the same this year. And while some of us may be moaning about not being able to see friends, and certainly Mary and I might be in that category, although I think we've more sense, you know, but yeah, it's not going to be great, is it? Not seeing friends. But the reason I'm not moaning about it, regretting it, but not moaning, is because I'm aware that many families will have an empty seat at their Christmas dinner table this year. There'll be empty seats all over the world. And that's tragic. So many people are going through a time of doubt and fear. That I think we need a small sign. A big sign would be good. But a sign to assure us. That God's still there for us. Isaiah prophecies about God's promise of a sign. 
Isaiah chapter 7 promises a sign that was given centuries before the shepherds heard that tiny cry coming from a bed of straw in a manger in this small village called Bethlehem. The year was 735 BC and Ahaz, king of Judah, was threatened by invasion from Assyria and Israel. <laughs> the Babylonians are off the hook this week. They're not going to be doing any invading this week. It's usually the Babylonians, isn't it? This week it's the Assyrians and the, issue, and the nation of Israel. Judah was a separate tribe. See, Israel had 12 tribes in it. Israel was a tribe. It wasn't the plague. Israel was one tribe. There was 11 others, and Judah was one of these. So the Assyrians, a mighty nation, were coming, and the, Israel, the tribe of Israel was coming in the other direction, all to attack Judah. Judah wasn't powerful enough to defend itself against two nations. And Ahaz, the ruler, the king of, of Judah, was preparing to withstand the coming siege for as long as he could. But he desperately needed a sign. Isaiah the prophet was sent by God to assure Ahaz, don't be afraid of these two smouldering sticks. Then Isaiah spoke those marvellous words. If you do not stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. That's out with our scripture, but this is further on. This is earlier. If you don't stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. And I wonder if that's, well, I don't wonder. I think that is a word for us today. These words were, were meant to strengthen Ahaz. They were meant to encourage him. But they were too direct, just too positive for Ahaz to hear. He was so wrapped up in his own fears that, that these words weren't enough for him. It's a bit like if you're going through real trouble yourself, you know, eh, often if I'm caught in the middle of anxiety or in the middle of a really heavy cold when I'm just murdered to live with, Mary will say, it's going to be okay. And I'm muttering away, hey, it's not going to be okay. It's never going to be. I think that's what Ahaz was like. He was so caught up in his own fears that he couldn't hear these words of encouragement. So wrapped up that words weren't enough. He has needed a sign. Just a small sign. Teensy one. And so reading his mind, the Lord patiently spoke to him. Ask for a sign. Any sign. Let it be as high as the sky or as deep as the earth. Just ask me and I'll give it to you. But still Ahaz failed to ask because of his false reverence towards the Lord. I will not ask for a sign. I will not put the Lord to the test. There's no pleasing him, is there? Ahaz's refusal to test God wasn't born out of reverence, but out of fear. And his fear had overcome his faith. God even let Ahaz choose the sign, but he didn't even have the faith to believe in God. So he used the excuse that he wouldn't put God to the test. Which is nonsense. It was fear. It wasn't reverence. And God knew this. God wasn't going to leave Ahaz without his sign. God gave Ahaz a sign. But it wasn't what he expected. That's for sure. Isaiah told him. A woman would conceive and bear a son. And the name of that son would be Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. What a sign. Nothing here about how God would protect Judah. No rosy picture of how Judah would win the oncoming battle. No, because this sign was much more important than that. Ahaz was promised that a baby called Emmanuel would come, <laughs> which would have surprised him somewhat. I think he was looking for reinforcements or arms or whatever, or that one of the armies would turn back. I don't think he wanted to hear about a baby. Here's a king shaking from fear of an invading foreign army, two foreign armies. 
and he's wondering whether he or his nation of Judah would survive. And God offers Ahaz a sign of a baby being born. But what this sign meant, what God was telling Ahaz was, no matter what will happen, it'll be okay, it'll be all right. And this will be a sign for you. A young woman who is pregnant will have a son and will name him Emmanuel. By the time he's old enough to make his own decisions, people will be drinking milk and eating honey. Even before that time comes, the lands of these two kings who terrify you will be deserted. God is giving Ahaz a direct promise that everything will work out fine. Or would it? What was the sign? Why would the news of a baby being born be any help to me and Judas, thinks Ahaz? The news that the lands of Ahaz's oppressors would be deserted may have been of some comfort. But God's left out one important detail. When? When's this going to happen? They're, they're on their way. If this is in centuries time, that's no use to me. When's this going to happen? Are we going to survive the oncoming invasions? I feel for Ahaz. I feel for him. The sign, what was he to make of it? Would it help him? Would it allay his fears? I don't know. I doubt it. You know, many Christians believe that Isaiah was prophesying the birth of Jesus. But if Isaiah was predicting the birth of Jesus, which would happen centuries later, how could this have been a sign for Ahaz? It's clear he wouldn't see this prophecy come to pass in his lifetime, so this prophecy is no help at all. Was Isaiah, was God wasting Ahaz's time? You know, some biblical scholars have argued that, that this passage in Isaiah does not point to the coming of the Messiah, but a rescue mission for Ahaz. Although I don't agree with that, I don't understand how Isaiah's words can be interpreted other than as a sign of a coming Messiah, the coming Messiah. But really, Ahaz was listening too directly. Sometimes in the Bible, we have to read a passage over and over again for its meaning to be revealed. We have to close read and then read again. And then read between the lines and then read again. And God's word is revealed to us in that way. Try it. See, the thrust of Isaiah's prophecy was this. Ahaz, put your trust in God not in the might of Assyria and Israel. For in a short space of time, prosperity and freedom will have returned again. As a sign of God's presence with you, a young woman will give birth to a son and name him Emmanuel. You see, the sign isn't just of the baby. Although it is that, the sign is in the word Emmanuel, God with us. God was saying to Ahaz, I am with you. Emmanuel, God with us, I'm with you. Faith in God is the key here. Isaiah was not just referring to the future miracle of the incarnation, but that just as God had been with his people in the past, he would continue to be with them in the present and into the future. God with us yesterday, today, yesterday, today and forever. The birth of this child, Emmanuel, was like a parable of God's presence. Isaiah looked forward to a time when God would save his people through Jesus Christ. And God did intervene, but far from saving his people from an external threat, God saved us from the deepest threat of, of all. The threat of death that is coming because of our sin. He sent Jesus to pay the price for our sin. For Christians, Isaiah's words have come to symbolise a far greater deliverance than just an invasion. 
God sent his son into this world through the birth of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. God chose what is small and vulnerable in this world, a baby, to bring us into the kingdom of God. Amazing. John Buchan, the author John Buchan wrote, There in Judea was born the one who is to proclaim a kingdom mightier than Rome, a world saved not by a man who became God, but by a God who became a man for our sake. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? Wonderful little passage there from John Buchan. A world saved not by a man who became God, but by a God who became man for our sake. The one who became life on earth as a baby in Bethlehem has changed life so that's never been the same since. God is with us. We listen to news reports of COVID-19. Religious wars, ideal ideologies, corrupt politicians. Who won that election again? Still don't know, do we? Crime and greed. And we conclude, understandably, that the world's beyond saving. The world's beyond the pale. Beyond saving. We look around and see a world filled with fear and misery and debt. But we should never forget the radical changes that the Christ child Emmanuel has brought to our imperfect world. With Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, working through the lives of faithful Christians, there's always hope for our world. Emmanuel has brought healing and wholeness and forgiveness and restoration to countless people who've professed faith in him. So return to, to return to Ahaz, who wanted this tangible sign. Well, we'd have to read on, and I suggest you do. But that tangible sign, well, the usual signs of Christmas might be missing for us this year. I wonder if we'll be able to visit the shops and hear Andy Williams and the Mike Sam singers drive me nuts as I walk through shopping centres. <laughs> ding dong, ding dong, peace, peace. Uh, I'm not a big Carols fan, but there we are. I wonder if we'll be able to do the things you usually do in Advent. It's looking that likely we may be able to share our Christmas with friends and family. But due to social distancing, we won't spend time with as many friends. We won't spend celebrations, parties, services as we knew them. With people. With people. Perhaps we won't spend so much this year. And if you're thinking that's a good thing, well, it might be. But what about our shopkeepers? They've got to make a livelihood. What about our economy, who rely on the business that this season brings, which usually sees them through till March? Maybe, just maybe, with all our worldly or traditional I'd say worldly, aspects of Christmas out of reach, we may be able to focus more on the coming of Emmanuel. Perhaps we'll have the opportunity to unwrap the true meaning of Christmas this year. Emmanuel, God with us. And while Christmas will be different this year, I hope we have faith to trust God to see us through this time and beyond. Ahaz was faced with a choice of believing and trusting God. And it's the same for us today. If people trust God, then our lives will be changed immeasurably. You know, I quite like what's familiar. I've said that to you before. You know, my biggest problem is that I usually think, well, if that worked, it'll work again. And I sometimes... I can sometimes find myself not moving forward and not moving the church forward as a result, but I'm working on it. I'm always working on it. Some people may cling to the commercial signs of Christmas because it's what they know, it's familiar. Some people won't risk having faith in something they don't understand, 
much like Ahaz who missed God's offer of a sign. This is probably the saddest sign of Christmas. People celebrate Christmas as if it was a pagan festival and they miss out on the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. Isaiah's prophecy of the coming Emmanuel was a sign of God's plan to redeem the world, to redeem us from our fallen nature, to forgive us, to offer us eternal life in his kingdom. Perfect, peaceful, eternal life. And life in its fullness on the earth. It's not just apple pie in the sky. It's more than that. We have life on the earth as well. You know, we can offer people a gift. We can share our faith. We can show people the sign that brought us redemption. The cross and Jesus Christ. The reality of the Christmas life is one of service. I said that last week. Demonstrating to others that we know God's love for ourselves. And perhaps we should share that. Our Christmas faith, our, Christ, sorry, our, Christmas, our Christian faith is God's sign to the world that the prophecy given to Isaiah was fulfilled. And that the church of Jesus Christ is the fullest revelation to the world that the Christ child has come. Wrap up your gifts. Start the buying. Unless you've started already. Mary and I have just about finished. We're sickening that way. But remember there's something else we can give. We can give a sign. And that will change people's lives long after. The Christmas pudding's eaten. The new socks are worn out. Think about it. Give Christ this Christmas. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed, perhaps you haven't, because it tends to fly through us, but there's been one thing that I've been pleased about this year. I better qualify this. I'm pleased about the message coming out of government, certainly in Scotland. That we're going through, certainly us in our part of the world, in the west of Scotland, we're, we're now in tier four, which is hideous. But Nicola Sturgeon has said she'll impose strict curfews now in the hope we can have Christmas together. The government is acknowledging Christmas, albeit as a holiday. But they're talking about Christmas. It's a start. It's a start. That's all it is. But, you know, everything has to start somewhere. And I'll take that start. Hallelujah. Sunday night this evening, 7 o'clock, we have our Zoom service where we have other people taking part. We've got videos, uh, other songs, so please join us. Same message, but maybe slightly altered, but uh, a much fuller service. So come and join us. Meanwhile, we'll, close our we'll sing our closing hymn. May God go with you. May you share the sign of Christ. May you share Christ's love with each other and with those who don't know him especially. We close singing Stuart Townsend's version of The Lord's My Shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd, of walks. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. Yeah.
guides my ways in righteousness. And he has my head with gold. And I And now hear the teaching of Jesus. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. May we now go to do God's will and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all and those whom we love now and evermore. Amen. Amen. Have a good week. Remember our Zoom service tonight. Uh, contact me at mike.gargrave at btinternet.com if you wish the Zoom link for our service and may God go with you. Speak to you soon.